Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight, and thank you for coming out in the inclement weather for our uh, winter Paul Mellon lecture, which has become a wonderful tradition here for a gathering of the, of the followers of the World Monuments Fund. Uh, I'd like to start by acknowledging the donor, uh, Mr. Paul Mellon, who cared so much about art and architecture and about uh, sharing his experiences with others. And the uh, Mellon Estate, and above all, the trustee, Ted Terry, who's uh, been a great mainstay of our education program worldwide, our work in Britain, and, uh, and this event. Tonight, our topic is Rome. And many of you will remember that three years ago, the Mellon Lecture was dedicated to the uh, Karachi, Annabali Karachi Gallery of the Farnese Palace. And Charles Dempsey gave us a wonderful comprehensive reading of the, uh, of the fresco program there that's entitled The Loves of the Gods. Those frescoes are now under restoration by the World Monuments Fund as well as the stuccos uh, yielding in the uh, Karachi Gallery yielding amazing results. And they will be revealed in all their splendor a few months from now by June of this year uh, people will be able to vi visit the Karachi Gallery, which has been very difficult in the past, on some kind of regular schedule and see these marvelous works. And so uh, we thought this would be, as we return to, as we complete that project and think about other things that we uh, are doing in Rome, a moment to return to Rome and think about its architecture. We're actually involved now in another aspect of the Farnese legacy in Rome, the restoration of the Farnese Gardens on the Palatine Hill, which comprises several buildings, uh, a little villa, two beautiful aviaries, grottos, and a garden area that's been uh, largely destroyed uh, by subsequent excavations. And these works will engage us for several years to come, but something for all of you to go and find when you go to Rome. Uh, and experience for, uh, for yourselves. And so as our lecturer tonight, we welcome Dr. Joseph Connors, who is an eminent scholar of Roman architecture, in particular uh, the Renaissance and Baroque periods and the work of Borromini. Uh, Dr. Connors is the only art historian who's been the director both of the American Academy in Rome and the Villa Itati in Florence, the Harvard uh, Study Center there and he's currently a professor of art history and architecture at Harvard University. He's lecturing tonight about the transformation of Rome in the Baroque period, and as our uh, invitation said, a look at the political and religious alliances and enmities that helped shape these spaces and the artistic version that gave them their meaning and flair. We will look forward to hearing all about this great moment of transformation in one of the most beautiful ancient cities of the world. So help me welcome Dr. Connor. Thank you for this kind introduction, Bonnie, and thank you, Lisa Ackerman, also for setting this up. I can't tell you how grateful I am and what an honor it is at places like Harvard, but also everywhere as we try and convince students that not only STEM subjects are worth studying, and even in the humanities, that not all humanities are entirely text-based, but they should somehow have a familiarity with the visual world, and if possible, with the world, the language of monuments. Uh, we struggle with this, and with some success, I hope, but to be in the company of people who have done so much to preserve and enliven the great monuments of the world. All I can say is we look at your work with admiration and reverence. Um, I heard you were going to Rome in uh, June, uh, some of you anyway, and um, uh, I know you're the kind of people that, that have good shoes and that like to be on the spot walking and looking for yourselves and not bust around all the time. So this is a talk really about the urban fabric of Rome, not about single monuments as such. Um, so it's a talk about streets and open spaces and what they might be saying to you 
about the people who built them or tried to build them and failed. So um, uh, it, it has six parts and 127, 125 slides and one movie. But I promise you that in 55 minutes, which means by one minute after eight, I will be, either I will be finished or you can get up and leave. <laughs> uh, Rome, of course, is, uh, you know where it is. And one, as one descends upon it from the air, of course, that rhinoceros horn of the Campus Martius bend in the Tiber makes it stand out. Uh, we get even closer, and you can see Rome there, of course, here, uh, with the Campus Martius um, and the bridges leading to the Vatican and so forth. Now, Rome is problematic because it has no single center, unlike Florence, which has an obvious center, Venice has an obvious center, but it's, it's got many centers and none of them is really a center. St. Peter's off on the upper left is, um, I wonder if you could put the lights down a little bit to darken the slides. That would be nice or no one's taking notes or anything. Yeah, okay, thanks, that's better. Um, St. Peter's at the upper left is very obviously not in the center. It's eccentric. It's the burial grounds. I liked in my comparisons in my classes, I like to say it's leaving New York by the George Washington Bridge and going to the Meadowlands, the great entertainment sports area where you could see gladiatorial games and so forth. It's like that, but it's certainly not central. The Lateran on the lower right was put by Constantine in an area that was very specifically out of it, so he wouldn't offend the senatorial class, the still dominant senatorial class in Rome. The Capitoline in the center has a certain symbolic meaning, and Michelangelo's Capitoline is a marvelous urban space, but it was hardly in the center of either papal or republican Rome, the Rome of Livy. It's really on the sides. Um, what I've encircled here, the bend in the Tiber, we call the Campus Martius, was, is to us old Rome. It's where you go to see the Pantheon and Caravaggio's and Piazza Navona and so forth, but was really outside of Rome. Um, the Capitoline encircled in red was the very edge of the Republican city. And if you left the Republican city and the dangerous Etruscan lands just beyond it, you were in the Campus Martius. And then eventually that was built up by Pompey and Augustus and Hadrian and then late antique emperors as well. It became a parade ground and ceremonial uh, ground in a way. But um, you have to remember it's outside of old Rome in a way. Now, much of what I want to say will deal with the street pattern of the Campus Martius. This marvelous uh, Italian model, which I show in a photograph here, shows you that the bend in the Tiber was originally green. It was a parade ground for soldiers uh, in the days of uh, uh, the Etruscan kings and then Brutus and the early Republic and so forth. Where you see the lake at number 52 was eventually filled in, although it's obviously a very low part of the city and that's where the Pantheon is today. It's why the Pantheon was flood, easily floodable in, uh, up till the end of the 19th century. Um, in any case, I've circled and read the Temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus on the Capitoline Hill just to show you the very, very edge of the Republican city and then beyond it, the Campus Martius is outside the city. Now, when you go to the Campus Martius, old Rome today, and you decide you're, you've got your shoes on, you're gonna really walk, um, you'll find it very confusing. Uh, everybody who visits Rome remarks on the difference between Florence, which is a Roman grid, uh, and Rome, which is so strange. You come across great facades that all of a sudden seem to loom at you out of nowhere. The element of surprise of the picturesque is enormous. Well, you can make sense out of it. The air views and Google Earth and so forth help a lot. I'd like you to think away for a minute. Uh, the very large street here, which is of course 19th century, that won't help us historically. It's a quite beautiful street and when you think about how the Corso Vittorio Emanuele was done by sparing so many buildings and curving and twisting, it's so refreshing compared to Haussmann's Paris, where everything was just destroyed, uh, but it's not our subject. If you look at the smaller, but then large streets, you'll see there's a pattern that looks like arteries. That's to say, um, um, an artery comes to a fork and then keeps on going, and you come to other complex places, or you go this way, you come to a fork, and then you go that way, you come to a fork, and so on. And it's as though you had an arterial system, it's my metaphor, for feeding the city, so to speak, through the traffic of commerce. 
Now, when you go to the places where the roads fork, um, such as the yellow circle up there, you find almost always they're enhanced because these are high rent areas where you can catch, obviously, a lot of traffic. Uh, one of the most beautiful of the enhancements is the so-called mint built under the Medici popes, Clement VII in particular, uh, which is fantastic placing because you see it as you come right off the bridge from the Vatican and then to enhance is as though your eye somehow had a shaping power and it makes the facade gently curve. Um, it was uh, one of the first curve, pre-baroque curve facades. It featured Medici arms and obviously the imagery that's being conveyed to you is that of a triumphal arch. You can't pass through it like you can a triumphal arch, but it's the imagery of a triumphal arch. If you go to where the yellow circle is there, another fork, you'll find, true to form, the fork has been enhanced now with a somewhat older building. This is around 1490s, Columbus's time, so to speak. And although it doesn't look as fancy as the mint that I just showed you, it's a very dignified, um, beautifully, uh, once painted building, painted with fictive stonework as though it were made out of marble, and then the beautiful loggia on the top where you can still see a little bit of the painting. So curving streets like arteries, and then enhance the fork are one of the rules that are followed again and again by builders in this complex area of Rome. Now, in the complex area, you can have two kinds of interventions, that of the papal power, which is trying to take over every function that had been that of the commune of Rome, the Popolo Romano. It's taking it over somewhat aggressively. Uh, the popes don't have a Swiss guard just for photographers. They have a Swiss guard because they are constantly afraid in the Renaissance of plots and assassinations and rebellions by the people of Rome. Um, nonetheless, they leave their footprint in the form often of straight streets. So uh, all of the arterial streets you see there, but the yellow delineates the Via Giulia, Julius II, uh, you know, Michelangelo Sistine Chapel man, about 1506, doing a street which is the street of business, of not leisure, necotium, not le leisure, where the red street on the other side of the river is the street of leisure, the street of villas. And the two of them are plowed through, sometimes through open areas or gardens, sometimes through built-up areas. Can you see how these streets here on the riverside are like a comb? They're, to some extent, right-angled to the Via Giulia, whereas the streets on the other side hit it at strange angles because they were already there. And they went to the river, and you couldn't really change them without great expense. But on the left, the river-type streets that was swampy land and poor people live there or no one, and you could have more of a comb effect. So you can see the popes imposing their will in the form of straight streets. Now, as you go along uh, Via Giulia, um, there, of course, is the great, I mean, even by modern standards, it's a wise, wide and spacious street. But as you go along it, you'll find these fragments, uh, three instances, for instance, where large pieces of travertine show you that something was begun and stopped. And the history of Roman urbanism is that of one dynasty starting something, getting halfway, and not being able to finish it, and the next papal dynasty, um, uh, the Della Rovere of Judas and the Medici of Leo X, the next papal dynasty does everything it can to make sure the previous papal dynasty's projects don't get finished. In any case, you see this sort of thing there, um, it's outlined in red there, it took up many blocks, it would have had a piazza as big as itself in front of it, and an artist working with a couple of scholars has put together a plan of the law courts that Julius wanted to build, which would have been one of the great buildings of Rome had it been finished. Uh, the masonry that I tried to show you was on the other side, on Via Giulia, but look how it would have gone almost into the river with a great Bramante chapel. This would have been a majestic statement of papal power. It wasn't been built, but not long afterwards, a cardinal who had been, in a way, raised by the Medici, Lorenzo the Magnificent, and, and, and then brought to power by Julius II and by his predecessor as well, I mean, as someone who knew how to navigate these oppositions, um, begins a palace, the Farnese Palace that you've heard so much about, begins here in about 15. 
15 or so, Raphael of all people and San Gallo and so forth are the great architects. But one has to, what I want to show you is not uh, the Farnese Gallery inside or, any, or the architecture so much as how it fits into the urban fabric. Um, here it is, the big, the big cube there. Uh, it's interesting that it turns its back on Via Giulia. So in other words, just uh, a couple of years after the death of Julius II, the new generation says we are not going to build on Via Giulia, we're going to make a different kind of statement. Now at first it's short-sighted because this street is very curving and it's not particularly, and these are all filled with houses here, but over the course of the next 20 years, the building gets built and it imposes its will on the urban fabric. It is in a funny way like a T-square or a cube that creates order around it. Those side streets have to be created by tearing down buildings and widening streets. And then in front of it, uh, between about 1518 and in the 1530s, hundreds, uh, maybe I'm exaggerating, but certainly dozens and dozens of houses are bought up and torn down. If there were ever an excavation there, the first levels would be these houses so that you could have a large piazza. Then, even more, a uh, large street is plowed through the Via dei Ballari, so you can be at a major intersection here and see the palace door, uh, really a major work of urban planning. Um, at the same time, this cardinal, Alessandro Farnese, has become Paul III, Pope Paul III, and has access to some of the great sculpture finds of the day. So these colossal statues from the Baths of Caracalla, the famous Farnese on the left and the famous bull, Dirce and the bull on the right, are now in Naples, but were then put in the Farnese Palace so that you could have garden sculpture. We're not quite sure where that was, whether the courtyard or the garden, garden fountain, and you could have a sense of an axis going right through the palace, out the garden, across what Michelangelo would have done as a bridge had he been able to do it to the other side of the river. So you have a tremendous sense of the palace at first making a square for itself and then imposing its order outward on the rest of the city. Uh, now if you go to one part of the Farnese Palace, you'll say, well, that's a little bit not fitting so well. You go to where the circle is there, and um, you'll see that the palace seems to stick out in an awkward way. Well, what's happened is there had been a street line where the cars were. A courtier of the Farnese is abled, enabled to buy that property to the right, to tear down the wretched little houses, and to rebuild it as a modest palazzetto, but he has to set back the line of building. So not uh, there, but here, in order to give a sense of, of dominance and view to the palace itself. And when you go down that street to the Farnese Palace, you're looking at the cardinal's bedroom, and he's looking at you. And then you look at the city fabric, and you see that he had a very large idea of cutting a street all the way through so that his view would go all the way up to one of those forks. Trouble was, this was the English college, and you don't make the English budge so easily, especially in this counter-reformational period when they had great allies. So that came to nothing. But, but what, you're, what you should be looking at in Rome are things that came to nothing. Your eyes should be peeled for these projects that came halfway and then didn't follow through. Um, I began with papal building, but one, my own thrust has been to look a lot at the private people. Well, no one's totally private in Rome, but there are cardinals of various degrees of wealth. There are wealthy private people. There are institutions such as monasteries, colleges, and so forth. There are uh, a whole range of builders who are, become not only shapers of their own sites, but shapers of the areas around those sites. They become like generators of little motors of urbanism. It's a very different way of thinking about urbanism from the straight street, so to speak. Now, how did people do this? If you wanted to change your property boundaries, you got a license from the Comune. The license was a long text which said that you can, sorry, you can go from area B here to point A and you can take over this public site because you've bought up all of these houses and you've made these people sell because if you're the big, it's a very plutocratic thing. If you're the, if you're the dominant presence on a block, you can force the sale of the lesser presences. You have to pay them, of course. 
And the formulas for payment, which are in excess of market value slightly, depending on whether you live there or not, I mean, it's all very regulated. But you can force the expropriation of neighboring people, and you can make irregular blocks very regular. So this gives all of that in detail, but the drawing is even better. And if you were the proprietor, you got the whole thing with the drawing. The Comune kept the text of the license, and nobody really was going to look at these unless there was a dispute, unless your neighbor said, let me see the license, and that's a fake. I'm going to go to the Comune and see the original. Well, at the Comune, you saw the text, but not the drawing. But that's okay. I mean, that was, that, you, you, anybody could prove uh, you know, what concessions had been given. Um, the trouble is very few of these licenses were kept by the private people who had them. I can only find five or six, uh, but I read once, I should have been reading the plays of Shakespeare, but once I spent a year reading the text of the licenses that are preserved, uh, trying to figure out streets and how they were shaped. Um, I'm turning this on its side for a minute to show you that the plot of land that was made, a very big plot of land next to the Trevi Fountain, was really kind of a wonderful plot to have in the end. And once you had it, you can call it architects like Borromini of genius who could use the slight trapezoidal form to give you a circular courtyard, fantastic staircases and horseshoe shapes. And you know, you might think, well, once you're inside a, a building like this, you'll never know that there's any irregularities whatsoever. Um, now, these licenses followed rules that are unwritten, but when you read hundreds of them, you, you kind of get the sense of them. And then occasionally you find a lawsuit where they're written even. And one of the rules is that you can take public land, but you have to give back more. For instance, here's a license where the previous property owned by a big church here, no, that's not a church, but even beyond there, up there, uh, they were allowed to tear down this whole property. And they were allowed to take over this dark spot here and make it a better piece of land. But they had to give this part of land back to the public. So you gave more than you got. And it seems fair enough. It seems that the city is gaining land. Right. Uh, but you, as a private or monastic or collegiate institution, had the right to shape space around you. So these people, this church up here, shaping space around them and eventually shaping even streets around them. They're becoming, they're be, you can become an urbanist on a smaller scale. And Rome, to some extent, is made up of lots of these little motors of ur urbanism generating their forms and sometimes meeting. Now, when you go around Rome, you should look for places where it didn't totally work. For instance, the toothed edge of the building there, I was sure, oh, sorry, I was sure that, huh, that the uh, little triangle of land here was given to them by the public in return for conceding areas somewhere else, maybe at the back of the building. Now, this, I, I, the date of this building, that volume of licenses was lost, unfortunately. But can you see how buildings in Rome can be like living licenses? They can show you what people were trying to do. Um, now, when you see these great facades of Rome, sometimes they're on a 19th century street now, sometimes they're in a tiny piazza. But you have to remember a rule that facades aren't just put into space, they demand their own spaces, they generate a space. Often they're in terribly small and cramped spaces, but they have the right to a certain kind of space, often a square but sometimes bigger in front of them. And it's the story of the building of the space around buildings that interests me. So this great facade of 1605, uh, you can see there, of the church of Santa Maria in Vallicella, Filippo Neri's church. Uh, you can stand in front of it today. It's on a wide open 19th century street today. But if you back up, you'll see that there's a narrower street that points right to the door. Why is that narrower street there? Because these priests had the right to buy up all of those houses, tear a lot down, and rebuild them, or give them to allies to rebuild so they can have a telescopic view of their facade. Um, the German word that was used by some of the pioneers of this field is visualizierung. You visualize your facade. Um, this is the, maybe the biggest, certainly one of the biggest Baroque facades in Rome, St. Ignatius. Um, very, very wide. And uh, I asked myself, well, what right did it have to space? It was built on a tremendously constrained, there was almost no room to back up. 
and it's finished. But okay, then the patrons say, well, we must have a right to back up. So I went to the drawings, I found original plans and so forth, and I said, they have the right to a square, I'm sure they do. And I went through a lot of drawings on this, uh, but eventually I saw, well, the right to a square works, but you don't necessarily stick with something so banal as a square. So in the end, yes, you have something of a square, actually slightly less here, but the architect, we're in the 1720s now, what we call the Rococo period, was really clever and uh, decided that he would make the square look like it leaked, so to speak, like roads were coming in and out of it. And then he put a lot of little buildings into the square, making them look like they're in conversation. So where I put the red circles here, he built three buildings. He could have built just one, all right. No, he built three buildings. And when you go there and look up, you have the feeling these buildings are in conversation, that the whole phenomenon of urbanism by alliance is being given a marvelous metaphorical um, instantiation there. Now, I'm going to look at two big urban projects after setting the stage, so to speak. You know them both, I'm sure. One is uh, Piazza Navona, and the other is Piazza San Pietro. Uh, um, Piazza Navona. Innocent X, Pamphilii, you see here in a beautiful portrait by Velasquez that's in the Pamphili Palace in Rome today. If you go up to the Met, you see the beautiful uh, Velasquez portrait of his, uh, his slave, uh, Wanda Pereja, one of the most beautiful portraits in the Met, done at exactly the same time by Velasquez. Uh, his coat of arms is a dove. He claimed to be bringing peace after a warlike pontificate. Uh, he also had connotations of Noah's Ark and, you know, at the end of the flood, Noah releases a dove and the dove comes back with an olive branch in its mouth. And so that's both a symbol of peace, but it also says, says to Noah, there's dry land somewhere there. So that's the shield of this particular pope. And I'm going to show you the story of how he comes to dominate Piazza Navona. Now, you go up into your helicopter or your Google Earth, which, which, whichever you prefer, and you, you look down on Rome, and of course you see this enormous area that's unbuilt. Curved top and flat bottom give you some sense that this was an ancient Roman structure. And of course it was. It was the stadium of the Emperor Domitian, uh, Vespasian Titus Domitian, or the Flavian emperors that followed Nero. Um, and the building is preserved, well, it's not preserved, it's shown in this beautiful model, um, two stories high. It was rather like the Colosseum, which of course is much higher, and had a different shape. But like the Colosseum, it had um, an elaborate system of entrances and arches and so on, and maybe statues in the arches, whereby you could get to your place up there in the seats. Now, the point of view of these great spectacular structures uh, was segregation of the classes, the senators going in one door, or the wonderful Italian Latin word is vomitorium, um, of the Colosseum with a the number there, would, would go right to the senate seats, or the equestrian seats, or the plebs. I mean, wherever you went in, you were funneled right to. So the whole idea of quick passage in an extremely efficient way was the ideal, and that's certainly the ideal here too on a slightly smaller scale. Um, what happens in the Middle Ages when these are abandoned is this kind of dynamic of abandonment whereby, uh, of course, there are no more games, there's no maintenance, there's a lot of looting. Um, if uh, there are uh, shops here, or brothels here in the Roman period, well, say you get a good Christian martyr there in the brothel like St. Agnes, well, actually she's, she's over here actually, but you can just take it. Um, then you get a little shrine of the martyr and then a bigger shrine. So the churches that spring up around such things are always on the outside, naturally. But eventually the story of Piazza Navona will be how three of these churches migrate to the inside uh, when the stadium becomes Piazza eventually. Uh, uh, now, I just want to show you the business of alliances a little bit and how some things can almost work but not quite. For instance, uh, you know uh, Pope Leo X is the Medici Pope of Raphael and the tapestry of the tapestries of the Vatican and, um, and the stanze of Raphael and uh, the later stanze and so forth, one of the great Renaissance patrons, Leo X. We're in the period 1513 to 21. Uh, as a cardinal, 
he lived in a rather nice palace right here with his statue collection and all of the books that now are up in the Laurentian Library in Florence. He brought, he brought the family library here. Um, he lived here, okay, and then of course moved to the Vatican. The family kept the palace. It rebuilt it a century later in the Baroque period, very sumptuously. It's now in fact the Senate of Rome. You see the guards standing in front. It's very hard to get into because it's the Senate, you know. But it was built sumptuously, and at the same time, a street was opened up on the side of the stadium, pointing to the stadium, or better still, you might say, in the stadium, pointing back to the center of the palace. So at that point, in 1642, the Medici, said, Medici cardinal said, ha ha, I have finally taken command of Piazza Navona, just like my ancestors always wanted to do. Now, he's not on the piazza, but it's the biggest palace visible from the piazza. But then, you know, the conclave in Rome is a very dicey affair. Uh, who knows who the conclave will be thrown up? You might get an Argentine, Argentinian Jesuit without even thinking about it, you know. Who, whoever is thrown up by the conclave is the pope. And after a difficult conclave, uh, a very minor cleric called Giovanni Battista Pamphilii is thrown up as Innocent X. It's from a provincial family from little Gubbio. I mean, they had put in roots in Rome a century before, but you know, it's, they're still considered provincial. And they had the tiniest pa palace on Piazza Navona here, nothing like the Medici. But in 1644, two years after the Medici finish, Giovanni Battista is elected pope and expands the palace and has a grand palace, but is not uh, satisfied, decides that the little horse trough in the middle needs a fountain, needs a new aqueduct, and then, you know, every palace, every pope needs a, I mean, he's not living here, but simply the family needs a chapel. I mean, who can, who can fault them? You just need a chapel. And so the uh, huge area is all by this method of expropriation. Palaces are taken over one by one from some of the oldest families in Rome, expropriate, paid for, Okay, paid for, but nonetheless taken over. And so eventually what had been, I like to think of it as two window bays or three window bays here, become 55 bays. And, and there were plans to keep on going past this fire break, but the Pope died after 11 years in the papacy. So, but you can see how left behind the Medici are with their little view here, and, and instead you get this unbelievable uh, sense of palace uh, now the Brazilian embassy, gallery, uh, the great church of Sant'Agnese in Piazza Navona with its dome, uh, the college of the Pamphili next to it, and of course Bernini's fountain on which I want to dwell. Uh, now the fountain. Um, the fountain is very strange. The water is low. It's uh, the Aqua Virgine, which is never a high aqueduct, and you can't make water rise. You can only keep, get it to the level that it comes into the city at. It has an Egyptian obelisk on top. Well, I say Egyptian, but it was really made, I don't know, in Egypt, I guess, or by Egyptian carvers, but it's in, it's in hieroglyphic, it's in Egyptian. But it was made by the emperor Domitian, the same emperor who made the stadium. Uh, and it talks about him as the pharaoh, but it talks about this uh, emperor of the year 80 AD, basically. It's not old, like old, old. It's uh, a Roman version of Egyptian obelisk. It was found at the time way outside of Rome, but it had come from very nearby. And it was brought back in five pieces, put back together very carefully, and there was a project of just putting it on a kind of nice base in the middle. Now, you know, Egyptian obelisks are on relatively low bases. At Luxor, for instance, you still have several standing. And the baboon base here, I can, I can touch the top of the baboons. It's not very high. The Romans put them on higher uh, bases, like say this high, with astragals as they're called. You can, these, these lions, they, they're pieces of bronze and you can put your hand onto the obelisk. The obelisk stands on four points. And then in these 1580s, when these four obelisks are raised again by Sixtus V, they're put on very high bases, enormously high bases, almost as high as the obelisk itself. So there's a sense of raising them and raising them and raising them. What Bernini does is without pier. Uh, he not only has a base like this for this poor little obelisk, it's not very big actually, but he has this amazing thing. It's like, you know, in the Phlegrean fields outside of Naples, you have these mountains that rise and fall overnight. Uh, it's as though it's one of those, some moment of bradaceismo, as they say, the, some mountain had risen up 
in order to give a base for four rivers, not just water now, but you'd have four rivers of the world. Now I ask my students, what are the four rivers? Are they the Mississippi, the Hudson, the... <laughs> no, all of them can be eliminated uh, if you know your historical geography. One is the Nile. No, no one could do without the Nile. And the Nile, whose source was not really known, actually it was sort of known, but it was not known, so his head is veiled. And the way Bernini worked was to have a... Really, these are, these are professional sculptors. They're not just assistants. They're really full-time major sculptors. He would do the clay models, many of which are in the Fog Museum, not this one, but many of the others. Uh, and, and then he would let, give the sculptor a lot of liberty for all the details. So it's a wonderful, efficient way of getting a fountain done. Uh, so you have the Nile, you have the Rio de la Plata, not the Amazon notice, but the Rio de la Plata in what we now think of as Argentina, who uh, looks up at the son of the obelisk with some surprise as though he's just being accustomed to Christianity. And around him you have coins that were originally gilt and strange cactuses and strange animals. And, uh, and then the uh, Ganges, the uh, wonderful statue of the Ganges. But by Ganges, he means the delta of the Ganges, uh, which is, of course, in Bangladesh now or in Bengal. Uh, and, uh, and the Ganges was famous for having a delta where dragons lived and where you could navigate by barge with an oar. So the oar is there, the dragon is there, and so forth. So this, this very philosophical looking Ganges is there. And then finally, uh, the Danube. And of course, the Danube is the favorite son. He's uh, the river of Austria. He's the river of Vienna. He's the river of the Habsburg emperor, who is, of course, presiding over Christianity in some uh, sense. Uh, there's a famous fish here that, you know, you, you, everyone looks at this fish. And uh, the sources are really quite precise. The fish is a Danube eel <laughs> that's swallowing all of this water. Uh, and then Bernini dresses up this beautiful display of rocks and caves with wonderfully, Bernini is so naturalistic. I find myself photographing oyster shells sometimes to show what his giant shells will look like. Here's a palm tree he gets of those special palms that don't have too much, you know, they're not very big, but they bend with any typhoon and then come back. Or here, this marvelous lion who is slurping up the waters of the Nile um, so good, actually. I kind of went and found a good lion. And I really think Bernini did, too. Um, now, what's some of the meaning? People now look at the concetto or the meaning behind these fountains. And one man that's emerged as very important for the fountain is a German Jesuit living in Rome called Athanasius Kircher. Kircher is a polymath. A wonderful book about him is called The Last Man Who Knew Everything. I mean, he writes on China, on music, on e Egypt. He thinks he's deciphered the hieroglyphs, although he hasn't. But he writes book after book on the stars, on the cosmos, on, on everything. Um, and it's for a long time it's been known that he was thinking about hieroglyphs. And so the upper part of the obelisk, the hieroglyphic part, is obviously something that he's thinking about. This is his book on it, his book on that, that very obelisk. And you can see that Hermes Trismegistus up here is deciphering the obelisks uh, while uh, a history or some allegory writes them down, but a little boy says, shh, these are secret. Crocodiles and everything show you're in Egypt. Uh, Father Time has pushed the obelisk to one side, but they're being deciphered. I mean, that's the kind of message that's being broadcast. But the marvelous thing, is that, and this is a relatively recent discovery by several colleagues of mine, uh, that uh, Kircher also wrote on geology. In particular, as a young man, he explored Vesuvius and Etna. He loved to go into craters and everything. He's very adventurous. And um, he began to think of a system of fire and water under the earth, great reservoirs of fire and reservoirs of water that would connect all the rivers of the world from South Africa to Europe and so on, uh, and come up, and that's, the way, and that's how Noah's flood was caused. Being a Jesuit, he couldn't say, well, God said, I'm going to create water. He had to say, God said, well, I'm going to use the water I've stored in my underground reservoirs, so many billion gallons, and I'll make the flood and put it back. I mean, that's the way they thought. So, um, and so we now have something that we can say not about the obelisk up, but about the fountain from the, that part down, that in some ways it's a marvelous uh, image of um, the underground caverns 
and reservoirs that Kierker thought were coursing through the veins of the earth. It uh, brings us in a funny way to a naturalism that I we usually think of as something in the 19th century, like Courbet's wonderful paintings of the Source de la Lou, the Lou River, where you really feel the magic of this great gushing underground spring. But being Baroque, it can't just be pure nature. It's got to be nature and art, and in particular, uh, art in the form of a book. Uh, Bernini once told a young Swedish architect, Tessin, um, he said, I mean, he must have been sort of really freewheeling, sort of said, you know, um, one has to design by the eye, you have to imprint something, and you must think of alternative models on paper, you know, and I'm getting down, clay models, always keep the imagination full, full of rich things, look at many prints, imprint on the mind a variety of ideas, but then inventing, pretend to be lost in the woods without any visual aids other than those that come from one's own imagination. Now, one of my finds very recently in the past year has been that, well, what prints? And here we have to cope with something that's very interesting, which I call universal Rubens envy. Uh, <laughs> Rubens, of course, was in Rome as a young artist, uh, very famous even then, uh, leaving in 1609 because he thought his mother, his mother was dying. He actually never saw his mother after, and hoping he'd always come back to Rome. But then had, of course, a great career in Antwerp. Everybody wanted to either be Rubens or to have a Rubens. Rembrandt is filled with Rubens envy. Rembrandt's patrons say, oh, if we can only get Rubens, well, we'll get Rembrandt, we'll get him to do that sort of thing. And I think Bernini was filled with a little Rubens entry, envy too. A great book, just, uh, printed just after Rubens' death, showing his designs for a royal entry into the city of Antwerp, appeared in 1641 and came to Rome right away. Uh, it was called the Pompa Introitus, you can see it, in honor of Ferdinand of Austria, who was a cardinal prince. And uh, it has dozens and dozens of plates, very beautiful. Harvard has a wonderful copy. And it shows how you, the, the, um, the Cardinal Infante would go through here and would be met by girls singing on a stage and everything. And everywhere he went, he would come to stages or arches where people would be singing and trumpeting. And a recent study has had a musicologist even do the trumpets, reconstruct the trumpets that were being played from these arches and so on. And for instance, here's a print of one of the arches. They were made by an army of painters and carpenters out of plywood and canvas, if they had plywood, but you know, you know what I mean. Uh, and for instance, Rubens would do an oil sketch like this one of Neptune up there. It's in the Fog Museum at Harvard. And the, the army of painters would do a giant, the size of the screen, uh, you know, version of the same thing. So this sort of thing could be set up in a few months, welcome the Cardinal Infante for a day, and then stay on the site for about six weeks before being dismantled. So we don't have many of the big pictures, but we do have a lot of these oil sketches. Now, I'm gonna focus just on one of these ephemeral things. It was a mountain through which the Cardinal Infante had to pass. It was called the Mountain of Potosi in uh, Bolivia. Uh, the Silver Mountain, the famous source of the silver for the Spanish treasure fleets. The, uh, Cardinal Infante would go through it. There was a front and a back, so it was like a door. But it was full of interesting stuff. It was basically a plea through the Cardinal Infante to the King of Spain, use the money from the Spanish Americas to revive the dead trade of Antwerp, which was being strangled by the closing of the river Scheldt and by the Dutch and by the war. Use that money to revive Antwerp. We are desperate. We've become beggars. So uh, the plea is couched in the usual Baroque way by having um, a statue by allegories like moneta, money, the mint, or Vulcan, who does gold and other things. Um, and then at the top, Hispania will be plucking the apples, the golden apples, and Hercules will be, you know, defeating the dragon that defends them, golden apples referring to the treasures of New Spain. And then good fortune and navigation and Jason and the Argonauts and the Golden Fleece. All of these, everybody knew all of these myths. Everyone knew their Virgil by heart, so they all comes in. Um, on the lower sides of the arch, you had two Atlantic rivers of New Spain. One, the Amazon, which he calls the Peruvius, and one, the Rio de la Plata. And on the other side, you can see they're higher, higher up. Uh, because they're Andes rivers that flow into the Pacific, they're called the Condorillo and the Marañón. So you had four rivers. And I think Bernini is, in his Rubens jealousy, 
even though he's a great sculptor and everything, but you know, he's not Rubens, um, said, I can do that too. And instead of being ephemeral made out of canvas and cardboard and wood, it would last forever and would be a work of great sculpture. And so his arched base for the obelisk is something like that, but even more, you know, if Rubens could have a lion hiding in the grotto, well, you know, um, so could Bernini. Uh, if he had coins showing all the coins of the Spanish monarchy, well, so could Bernini. If he had all sorts of wild beasts and monkeys and things on the top of his mountain, well, so could Bernini. If he had trees, well, Bernini can't do a stone tree, there's the obelisk there, but he could put a tree on the side, and, you know, if you have a snake on top of the mountain of Potosi, well, why not have a snake there? This is really a case of serious Rubens jealousy, I think. <laughs> and, uh, but that's, that's the source of this marvelous thing. And one of those four rivers survives. Of course, it's not a fountain in Piazza Navona about South America. It's a fountain about the whole world, uh, as, as it was more or less celebrated, uh, Europe, India, the Nile, and, um, and, and South America. But it is the Rio de la Plata that survives in the final fountain. Well, Bernini, of course, had fun with a total urban space. You would never flood Antwerp, but Bernini resolved, found a way to flood by blocking the drains, the whole of Piazza Navona. It was famous as an event to which the aristocracy uh, came in their carriages, and it survived until the age of photography, strangely enough. Of course, it's not, not done today. Now, I wasn't going to talk about Trevi. I'm going to go through it really just two slides. But since it was on the invitation, when you visit the Trevi fountain, you, you can think, if you like, of the fact that it was two palaces put together. They had a garden between them, so it becomes, it seems like a single palace, but it's two, and that uh, the statue in the middle is ocean, and it's a theme about the cycle of the waters that go from, you know, um, rivers to ocean to, to, to clouds to rain to rivers and something like that. You can think about that, but I think if you look closely at the most interesting part of it, the rocks, the so-called scogli, you'll see that this is a descendant of Piazza Navona. Uh, just as Piazza Navona had all those Rubensian things on it, the artist here called Nicola Salvi spent years or decades with his sculptors putting dozens of species of exotic plants on his rocks. This is his tribute to Bernini. The last urban space I want to speak of in my minutes, is the uh, piazza in front of St. Peter's, of course. Innocent X was the pope of mid-17th century, and it's kind of chaotic by the time of his death. There's no doubt he was senile, and there was all sorts of misgovernment going on, not the least of which was all the money going into Piazza Navona. And the next pope was much more of a diplomat, much more seasoned, um, much better administrator, but he realized that in whatever time was left, he really could make a mark on Europe not by diplomacy and war, but by building in Rome that would then be talked about by people who came to Rome. It was a dramatic shift of how the papacy would make a mark. Uh, he's called Alexander VII. He is a TG from Siena, a banking family. Uh, his symbols are Monti, three, or pardon me, six mountains with a star, or an oak tree, but Six mountains, you know about the Monte dei Paschi di Siena. Monte means mountain, or it also means bond issue. So it's a kind of thing that's often used by banking families. Uh, Assinis, whose family had been active in Rome earlier, but not active lately, and he comes back to Rome in triumph in a way. Uh, and you see these Monte kind of big in a way, often in Rome. This is one commemorating the entrance of the Queen of Sweden into Rome. Uh, now, although there are I, wouldn't, I was going to say dozens, but certainly a dozen or 20 uh, urban projects that are either conceived by Alexander VII or pushed along and helped, prodded by Alexander VII. So, so much so that we speak of Alexandrine Rome. He's the great builder pope of all time in a way. Although not every project was his paying. I mean, some of them were just religious orders where he said, you finish that piazza or I'm really going to suspend something or other. You know, there are, there are pressures that he can exert. But the one great project is, of course, the piazza in front of St. Peter's that took his entire pontificate. Well, uh, everybody knows it. You have the church here. And in front of the church, you have a somewhat trapezoidal, narrowing piazza. 
which of course can't, the Sistine Chapel is very close, whereas it's, uh, the Pauline Chapel is here, and um, I guess that's the Sistine, and somewhat, yes it is. Uh, and, and the Papal Palace is here, I mean these things can't be touched. So that part of the piazza has to be relatively constrained. But then you notice that it goes out following the curves of an oval, which are a series of circles, with an obelisk in the center and two fountains. Now, um, this is a better view of it from the top of St. Peter's, where you can see the obelisk, the two fountains, and the two curves. And the narrow part is not much in view of my camera here, but it's, it, you can imagine it's there. Now, when we see the piazza, when you, go, when you climb St. Peter's today, you'll get the sense of an enormous Parisian-like boulevard going far, far away to the river. Well, that's a, something of a false impression. Um, uh, the, the original situation was to have two, not necessarily narrow, but two Renaissance streets, one straight on the left and one slightly curving on the right, that made it something of a surprise to walk into the piazza. Those five blocks of older houses that included a palace by Raphael and so forth were there and were meant to have a long life. So they were pulled down in the 1930s and the whole street was completed in the 1950s. They became a symbol of the conciliation between the Vatican and Rome. So it's called the Via della Conciliazione. But you have to remember that the piazza was conceived in a very monumental way, but as surprise, to some extent, of someone walking in. It's also a saucer. So when you come here, this is the rim, being the rim of the saucer is rather higher than here or here. And so, people who need a view will stand on the lip or the rim of the saucer. Um, now, this is a marvelous drawing, a very, rather large drawing, in the Fogg Museum at Harvard that I just adore. It's a Frenchman of the 1640s who went to the top of St. Peter's and drew with his very exact eye everything he saw. Uh, he, he did the palace and the Sistine Chapel too, but I'm not showing that part. He showed the bell tower of Bernini, which is going up, uh, but will eventually be a failure and have to be pulled down. He shows the whole construction work up here, but I'm using it to show you how someone might think through the piazza. Now, there are hundreds of drawings for the piazza. My colleague from Rutgers, Todd Martyr, is now working to sort them out, and they're incredibly difficult in what, went, you know, what decisions were made when, but the big decisions are relatively easy, I think, to see. The obelisk had been moved there in front of the church, in the 1580s, so that's not going to change. Uh, it had been moved into a, in the middle of a huge, what they called campus or field, where people would gather for the papal blessing. And the field was very irregular. If you look on the left, the north, you can see an enormous open space with a fountain in it. Um, and, um, you know, that's plenty of room there to build. But if you look on the right, it's full of houses, some of them quite expensive, some of them palaces. So the basic strategy of any pope who wanted to do something like St. Peter's would be to build this part here, and then to build the semicircle here, once they had arrived at the form of a semicircle. And if, you know, popes, they're not guaranteed, they don't have a term of office, they have a term of life. And so if this pope had died after five years, it would have been half done. But the other half would have been sort of an obligation, you might think, on the successor. In any case, the pope lived 11 years, and so both sides were done. Um, and uh, the fountain, which was off axis of the obelisk, could easily be moved here, and the pipes moved, and then a twin given over here. And I think you have the basic idea of the piazza right, right there. And you go up there today, this is only the left half, and you can see how beautifully that left half, the north half, fits into the open space and how the fountain has been beautifully aligned now with the obelisk. The obelisk hasn't been moved. It's right here. It never was any different. Now, the funny thing about taking pictures from the top of St. Peter's is that if you do, you'll always find a group of people here. Well, I mean, there are lots of groups of people. Why not there? But the thing is, you'll always find a group of people there. And you go there today and you look on the pavement, and you'll see a granite disc which will say center of the colonnade, or meaning the north colonnade, because the uh, piazza is designed in a way so that from inside that colonnade looks like a forest of columns, or a cane break, someone said at the time. Looks like a forest, four columns thick. How, how can you ever see your way through it? But when you stand on that single spot, 
it lines all of those four columns in depth line up for you and your vision can go around it. My uh, movie shows you that. Uh, sound effects, but what can I do? <laughs> they all obey your eye. And you come to the fountain, of course, and then you keep on going. Uh, you see what a magic thing it is. It's both enclosure but screen. It's both closed and open. It's a marvelous work of the psychology of how you create an open space. So, um, and then Bernini, of course, is not content there. He has enough time in the subsequent pontificates to get some not urban work done, but work on statues. The bridge went going to St. Peter's, uh, was there since Hadrian's time, but it's lined with statues of the two apostles, but especially of angels holding the uh, instruments of the passion, uh, Veronica's veil, the crown of thorns, uh, the sponge, and so on, the nails, uh, so that you, the pilgrim, are reminded of Christ's passion as you go to the tomb of Peter, and then you come up against the facade after that surprise that I mentioned. Um, in many days, it's empty and beautiful and a wonderful work of early Baroque architecture by Carlo Maderno. But then on one day of the year, it's not empty at all. It's a, a tremendous stage set for a tiny person dressed in white and magnified by fabric and by architecture to give this amazing blessing to the world and to the city, as it's said where hundreds of thousands of people might try and see this one speck of light. Now, blessings are very important that you see the person. Um, otherwise, there's a certain electricity that's lost, I guess. Yeah, you think of it yourself. I mean, if, if you're going to go that far, you want to see the person giving you that blessing at 12 o'clock exactly. You don't want to miss that. And so, Bernini do this. And the way people line up is really marvelous. This 1950s aerial photograph shows it. You don't stand here because you can't see. You don't stand here because you can't see. You don't stand behind the fountain because you can't see, or the obelisk, uh, and you don't stand behind that fountain. So it's as though the Pope were a beam of light, and we have white shadows, so to speak, on the ground where people are, uh, where things are blocking. It's like an inverse of light casting its dark shadows. But it's because you have to see that blessing, and the whole psychology of the piazza. And, and by the way, look how thick people are here on the rim. So, sorry about that. Uh, they're very thick on the rim because you really want to see. That's the main point. And then Bernini had time towards the end of his life when he's getting unfashionable, but there, there was enough time and enough pat papal patronage to do the end of the church, the sea of St. Peter, the seat of St. Peter, this throne, tiny thing, but it's put inside an enormous bronze reliquary inside with the Gloria at the end. And then... Um, Alexander VII, the patron of this fantastic uh, piazza, uh, planned his tomb. Of course, the papal tombs are not necessarily finished by the time of the death of the pope. This one wasn't. But it was finished in the next decade. And uh, it's in a wonderful situation inside St. Peter's. We have a drawing. I must say no one I know has put this together. But we have a drawing uh, from the Renaissance, to be precise, the 1530s, showing uh, Bramante's church. This is a niche in Bramante's church. And uh, there was a door in it. Part of Bramante's plan meant you could be able to go out that door. And this niche, which might have even had some statues in it, was taken by Alexander and then his successors as the site of his tomb. And the door is still there. But it becomes the door of death. And the, the, the virtues, charity, uh, the naked truth that was unacceptable, so she was clothed in white lead in the next decade, uh, and justice and so forth, uh, are looking up in mourning because the pope that favored them all is there kneeling. And out of the door of death, it'd be nice if the door were closed uh, because it would give it such a... But anyway, out of the door of death comes the uh, sarcophagus, pardon me, the, the skeleton, which says to the pope, your time is up, your time is up. And he says to himself, yes, but I've done a lot. You, I think I'd like you to just think when you're on your feet in Rome of some of these points you might take away, although there are hundreds one might think of, but nonetheless from this complex series of slides, I hope you get some sense when you go through Rome that you're thinking of whether you're on a straight street or on a curved street, whether you're on a papal imposition on the urban fabric or whether you're on one of those medieval winding arteries which where you could expect forks and so forth. And then I hope you begin to think of how 
private or corporate patrons engineer their prominence through corners and curves and building on forks and the engineered prominence of Roman buildings in this complex street pattern is so important. And then remember when you see these facades that they're not just built. They create their own space. And sometimes that project for space is fulfilled and sometimes it's unfinished and you're standing in the fragment of a dream. But you have to remember that they are somehow trying to create their own space. Um, when you come across water, it's almost never private. It's a papal prerogative because of the expense of building aqueducts. So uh, it's, Rome is sculpted out of brick and out of travertine and out of marble, but it's also sculpted out of water. And almost always the fountain is saying something about the ideology of the papacy at the time it was built. And finally, and this is the lesson of Trevi and of uh, Piazza Navona, think of this wonderful way in which art subsumes nature from trees to armadillos to crocodiles to fantastic plants and so forth. Somehow nature invades uh, the city in the Baroque period, becomes art, and lends a lot to the magic of Baroque Rome. So thank you. Thank you.